So we're going to get started. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Let me know in the chat if you if you cannot. Um, welcome to tonight's event. My name is Bradley Trumpfeller. I'm a, an events host at Brookline Booksmith, uh, based in Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, if you're familiar with our store, welcome back. If this is the first time you're hearing about us, uh, welcome. Uh, we're very happy to have all of you join our community this evening, and we appreciate your support of the authors as well as an independent bookstore uh, through both your purchases and your attendance tonight. Um, tonight's event is part of our ongoing transnational literature series. The series focuses on works of literature and art that center migration, displacement, the idea of home with an emphasis on the work, on, on excuse me, works in translation. The series was founded and is directed by my colleague, Shuchi Saraswat. We host regular events with writers and translators from all over the world. You can keep up with that schedule by visiting the series' page on Brookline Booksmith's website, following the series on social media, and signing up for our weekly newsletter. Uh, my colleague Pierce will be joining us in the chat today. Uh, she'll be sharing purchase links and information about uh, Stranger Faces and Transit Books, um, the publisher of, of the wonderful book. Uh, the chat and question box are open to everyone, so feel free to make use of those. Uh, please do note that Brookline Booksmith has a pretty strict policy against uh, abusive behavior and language, and at our discretion, any attendee can be removed from an event for partaking in such behavior, so please just keep that in mind. Um, great. So all that said, I'm just going to, uh, to introduce uh, Namali and Adam. Namali Serbel is a Zambian writer and professor of English at Harvard University. She's a recipient of a 2020 Wyndham Campbell Prize for Fiction and the 2015 Kane Prize for African Writing. Her first novel, The Old Drift, won the 2020 Ansfield Wolf Book Prize for Fiction and the 2020 LA Times Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction and was named a, New York, named a New York Times Notable Book of 2019. Her newest book, Stranger Faces, part of Transit Books' Undelivered Lectured Series, is a collection of speculative essays that orbit the face of the strange and the stranger. The disabled face, the racially ambiguous face, the digital face, the face of the dead. How do these sorts of faces appear? How do they challenge what we consider when we talk about the human face and that attendant discourse of the human? Stranger Faces is a brilliant book, by which I mean it is a book that wants to cast a light using the full force of Namali's imagination and criticism to tune into other possible ethics, other possible ways of seeing and being with one another. Uh, unfortunately, our um, our planned uh, co-host, Chris Abani, uh, is unable to join us tonight, so we're, we're very excited to have uh, Adam Levy join us. Adam is the uh, editor-in-chief of Transit Books. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here, and without further ado, I will, I will hand it over to them. Thank you very much. I should say I'm only one half of the team uh, behind Transit Books, but um, yeah, it's a pleasure and an incredible surprise to be here. <laughs> I, I only learned that I was stepping in a few minutes ago, but it's always a pleasure to talk with Namali, especially, especially about a book that um, has lived with us, both with me for, I don't know how long we've been working on it together, a little over a year, and with you for much longer than that. Maybe you could start by just telling us um, how the book came to be and um, yeah. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to Brooklyn Booksmith and to Adam for stepping in. Um, so this book began as the seed of uh, a second book project. So when you're a graduate student and you are thrown into the turbulent waters of applying for the academic job market, you're asked to create these documents that say who you are and say what your work is. And then make. they also ask you, there's this one paragraph in your cover letter, which is what is your second book gonna be? And by this point, you've just finished your dissertation. So you have no idea what your second book is gonna be. It's a castle in the clouds. But I knew that I was still interested in the discipline of ethics and literature, which is a kind of subfield in literary study, very interested in whether reading is good for us, <laughs> in whether um, some of the platitudes that we have about reading making us better people or empathic people are actually true, um, and whether certain kinds of literature are more conducive to that than others. 
So one of the theories that I saw coming up again and again in literary study is from a Jewish philosopher, Emmanuel Levinas, who was very interested in what he called the face-to-face -face encounter. This to him is the primary location where ethics happen, is when you're facing somebody else. And he posited that the face of the other person is what makes you realize how humble you are in front of basically your ethical responsibilities to other people, to the neighbor, right? To, which is something that we're used to from uh, Judeo-Christian thought more generally. And I was interested in this um, because it's, it, it's, it struck me as both true and as not quite accurate to how I experience faces in the world, but also not quite true to how I experience faces in literature, <laughs> in films and fiction, um, because we seem to be, as a human species, also really obsessed with faces that are not directly in front of us and human and glowing with a sense of ethical responsibility. We love to play with faces. We love to see faces in, you know, uh, plug outlets and in tree, in tree trunks and, and in water sometimes, in clouds. But we also, when we look at other people's faces, we don't always look at them face to face, right? One of the, the cliches that um, I love the most uh, is the idea that when you're in a relationship, you don't want to be facing each other. You want to be standing next to each other facing the same way. It's a, it's a really lovely um, kind of uh, romantic vision of, of, of both seeing, uh, looking into the future together. But what does that mean for ethics if, you, if you're not looking at each other? Um, and, you know, so I, I started thinking about these questions um, more seriously once I actually got a job. Um, and what was really, really lovely is that a lot of the uh, texts that I became interested in, like Hitchcock's Psycho um, and uh, Herzog's Grizzly Man, for example, um, or the Bond Woman's narrative, were texts or books or films that were coming to me through my teaching. Um, so my book is actually dedicated to two of my former students, um, Emily Brennis and Mike Isaac. Mike Isaac is now a, um, a, a very um, well-known journalist in his own right. He writes for the New York Times about um, social media, about Facebook in particular. Uh, Emily Brennis is, uh, is a graduate student. Um, and so there's, a, you know, this idea that it's through interactions with my students that these texts came to me is, was a real source of, of joy for me. Um, I worked with Andrea Gadbury, who has just published her first book as a professor, um, at, who was a graduate student at the time, and we, we worked on uh, uh, having uh, uh, or organizing uh, a two-day conference on faces. Um, while I was at Berkeley. So it was, in some ways, the book felt like it came out of this like uh, Castle in the Clouds, this kind of dream that I had as, a, as an, a graduate student just struggling to get a job, but it eventually became this very communal project, one which I'm really happy to say has involved you as well as you've, as you've midwifed it um, in, into being now. I'm curious um, why the, the different face, the different so-called stranger faces in particular that you chose, because it's a really wide range of them. Yeah. Um, from the racialized face to the digital face. It's a lot of them are faces that, um, you know, are mediated by an, another factor or force in really interesting kind of ways. I'm wondering why those in particular and sort of um, the way that those very different stranger faces came to speak to one another, if they did at all. That's a really good question. I think, you know, I, my first academic book was on, was called, it was about uncertainty. It was called Seven Modes of Uncertainty. And my first novel is called The Old Drift. Um, drift, uncertainty, and faces are very, very broad umbrella terms. So every time <laughs> I've talked to people as I've been working on these projects, they're like, oh, have you thought about this work of uncertainty? Yeah. Oh, have I you feel thought like driftwood or have you thought about this face so many people have sent me so many different kinds of faces and i think at the end of the day it's it's actually a little bit like what um roland bart says about photographs in his um beautiful book camera lucida he says that uh certain photographs or uh, strike us they and he calls it a punctum 
as you know something that pierces you and so it can be the particular look on someone's face or um, the, a gesture, a rip in someone's clothes, the way a button sits. And we all know this from photographs, especially of family members, um, something in their face, something in their hair. And I think with all of these texts, it was a similar kind of experience where I would be watching and I would be suddenly just struck by a very particular image, very often an image. And that's actually also how I work as a fiction writer. Um, very often something strikes me um, an image, a thought, a, a, a sensation, um, and then I'm, I'm kind of stuck on it and I, I'm trying to work out why it is that it puzzles me. Mm. It's really interesting. Lisa. I should also confess that I, I too was one of those people sending you things like, oh, no, Molly, <laughs> did you see this thing about faces? Did you see this thing about football helmets that obscure the eyes i mean it's all super interesting you know this is one of the things one of the things i love about writing about something like faces is that everyone has an investment in it because it is such yeah. a human thing and you know you know i i did very very little actual scientific research here, but um, there is, you know, a part of the face called the fusiform face area. I mean, part of the brain, <laughs> sorry, called the fusiform face area. And it lights up when, whenever we look at any kind of face, whether it's a, mm -hmm. a metaphor face, an imagistic face, or, and when that part of the brain is damaged is when people have um, face blindness, right? So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a, it's like built into us to be obsessed with faces. Yeah, that's, uh, oh, this is a, uh, it, it's interesting because, I mean, especially in this current moment, we were talking about this briefly a few weeks ago, that this is a time when the face is primarily obscured by masks. I'm wondering if, if uh, you've reconsidered or thought more uh, deeply about the ways in which our mask wearing culture now has informed our interaction with the face and whether that also to whether that also pre presents a kind of new ethical question for us in terms of how we relate to each other. I mean, it, it feels really lovely um, to have mm -hmm. um, the world in this very, you know, terrible time. Um, but that basically, it, I feel like our masked culture um, has proven my argument in this book correct, <laughs> uh, which is to say that the face-to-face -face encounter um, itself, which we think of as being necessary and primary and um, the only way you can really know if someone is being truthful or if someone is um, uh, is being good, um, that it's the source of not just of beauty, not just of, you know, attraction for us, but a source of ethics for us and a source of um, authenticity. It's like actually turns out that looking at each other through screens and looking at each other with masks on, um, we still are ethical. We still are truthful. We still have a, a, some kind of basis of relation, um, even if it's not what we might be used to. And I think one of the ways that it, it can help um, is that it can make us more aware that having a face and having a face to face encounter is a kind of privilege. Mm. That not everyone gets to have a face and not everyone gets to have a face to face encounter. Not everyone gets to, to communicate with their family members through technology a lot of the time because not everyone has access to that. Right. And their lives are not therefore, you know, worse and depleted and horrific. They've people just have different ways of communicating with each other. Um, one of the things I think is, is, you know, um, the small, small things that I've noticed, but, um, you know, catcalling, no difference at all in how often I get catcalled, even though I have a mask on, <laughs> which is to say like that's, you know, different people have different feelings about being catcalled. Um, some people find it enraging, other people, other people find it flattering, some people find it sociality, depending on what culture you're from. But I find it hilarious that it actually hasn't, you know, that even the injunction for, for women to smile it still comes, even though they wouldn't be able to see the smile. <laughs> you know, it's like I had a man today. I was walking down the street with my mask on, who just looked at my eyes and was and and you know profusion of compliments. And I was like, this is really interesting to me because it obviously has nothing to do with my actual face. And that's a very interesting. So then it's like, what does it have to do with? Is it just sexism, or is it 
do we actually have some way of registering uh, recognition of beauty in someone else that has to do with their forehead, their eyes, their hands, their gait, the way they walk, the way they move, the way they tilt their head, their hair, right? There's just so much else in the world than the face. And I think the masks are showing us that. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I think one of the things that you're kind of pointing to and you discuss in the book is the fact that we can take pleasure and that we often do take pleasure in these so-called stranger faces. I'm wondering, I mean, because the faces that you talk about in the book, there's a really wide range of them um, and they do reach a certain kind of extremity in terms of the way that they appear. I mean, we're talking about um, the face of the dead, the face of animals. Um, we're talking about the uh, the face of the elephant man. I mean, this is really, these are kind of faces at their extreme. I'm wondering if you could talk about how this pleasure piece fits into it. Yeah, I mean, I think, as I said before, we are, we have a desire to see faces kind of built into us. Um, I think, I think it's similar to the way that we have a desire to communicate through language. It's built in, right? All humans have it. And it's, it's built into our brain there, you know, MRI scans show different parts of the brain lighting up and so on and so forth. And in the same way that language is always the ideal goal that we are aspiring to, to get it right, to get it precise, to know exactly which words to say in which order to make them beautiful. But we always come up short, as you know as an editor, <laughs> and as I know too well as a writer. I think the same is true for faces. We want to see faces we want, to, we want those faces to mean exactly what the person behind that face is conveying or even what the, the object itself um, is conveying. We, we, we want faces to be this ideal location for us to communicate, but we always fail. We always get it slightly wrong. Um, so there's a study that um, I really like to, to cite that uh, it had, it was measuring people's recognition of facial expressions across uh, a bunch of photographs, essentially. And um, it was showing that basically we think we understand people's expressions, their emotions um, all the time. We think we get it like 100% right, but it's more like 50% of the time we get it right. <laughs> um, and we know that there's huge cross-cultural differences. And this is one of my favorite factoids about emoji, right? Um, yeah. So you may know the emoji, the, you know, the Japanese, um, uh, originated emoji which has like the yellow face with like the st streams of, of, of smoke coming from its nose oh yeah yeah which most people in the West use as meaning um, I'm angry or frustrated but in Japan is it's supposed to be like I'm feeling strong and confident <laughs> right so even cross-culturally faces mean different things um, so for me uh, the part of the the argument for the book is that, we have this desire for language to mean, we have this desire for faces to mean exactly what they say or what they look like, but actually we always fail. But actually that failure is a source of great pleasure for us. Yeah. Right? That's what we get to play with emoji. We get to make art out of faces. We get to uh, draw and paint and film and manipulate faces. Um, and so, you know, the GIF, for example, is one of my favorite things, right? Or the GIF, I never know which it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, the way we manipulate faces in, in those, in this new social media world, to me suggests that actually what we're, what we're doing when we're trying to make faces mean is that we're actually playing with faces the way that we play with language. Mm. I like that. And it's, I, I feel like you feel that especially um, in the emoji chapter, because you, you do, there, there, you sometimes see articles and things about the ways that emojis might approach or might, might replace 
language. It's more precise. It can say something more accurately than words can. And that really what, what you find is that they're just as inaccurate as words, if not in, incredibly more inaccurate. But there is something within, within that space between the two, between the intention and the effect, and between what they, um, uh, what we intend them to mean and, and how they are read, that actually is the fun part. That's the thing yeah. that you can play with. And I, I think there was a, I don't know exactly what the, my, my personal history with uh, emojis or yours was, but <laughs> I feel like there was a period where I was incredibly resistant to emojis because they seemed like a kind of lesser form of speech. And then somehow at a certain point, I, I converted to emojis and now I'm like a gratuitous <laughs> emoji user. Uh, I'm using the like laughing, crying emoji all the time, which seemed like truly the most inarticulate use of emoji speech. And now it's just like, it's the only way I communicate. Yeah. Although I have to be very selective about the emojis that I use with you because I think that you are a true connoisseur of them. No, I'm not at all. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I mean, I, I have like probably four or five that I use all the time. And, you know, I think it, I was talking to my friend the other day um, who just, she just sent me a, a screenshot of a set of emojis that her mother had sent. And she was like, my mother just doesn't know how to use emojis. And I was like, my father doesn't know how to use emojis. I had a <laughs> screenshot. And, but what was so interesting to me, like, the way her mother misuses them and the way my father misuses, misuses them, in our opinions, are, are very different. So her mm -hmm. mom is looking for the emoji that most captures the strange um, like mix of feeling that she feels. Oh. So, so when you have like, you know, um, the, the laughing, crying emoji, right? Some people think it's like, I'm laughing so hard, I'm crying. Other people think it means I'm crying through my laughter, Oof. which I, is like a, <laughs> I hate that misunderstanding. <laughs> but there's but her mother was using a, um, a, a like a skeptical looking sad face. It was the skeptical face, but it was like a, supposed to be a sad face um, about uh, something um, burning down. And so mm -hmm. it was like, but it was like something, it was like a, a, a place that, you know, my friend's um, family had a bad history with. It was like a, some sort of country club or something. And she was like, she was trying to express this ambivalence by using like the most awkward looking emoji. Whereas my dad misuses emojis primarily by trying to make sentences of them. So he tries to like- Really? That. Well, instead of combining feelings, he puts one feeling after the other. So it's like anger, mm -hmm laughter instead of putting like the two of them together right because he, yeah. so he like tries to combine them but again what i think is really fascinating is that because she knows her mother so well and because i know my father so well we know exactly what they're saying yeah. we just know that they're using the language in their own special way you know no absolutely i mean in the same way that we would understand um that kind of possibly general generational um, difference in in usage over text say or email or whatever the thing might be I mean yeah my my parents sound incredibly severe in all of their texts right because everything is just very formal with a period right. and <laughs> it always seems like there's an ultimatum attached to the most right. simple things but <laughs> I mean, um, the emoji sits somewhere between um, language and punctuation, right? It's, mm. And an and and that kind of uh, utterance, mm, right? The kind of like uh, noise between language. That so it's it it functions in all of these really interesting ways, and I think it's pretty amazing that even though we have this ex ever expanding iconographic ideogram version of emoji like a shoe an umbrella and so on and so on, different foods that we gravitate toward having faces and we gravitate toward more and more uh, different kinds of expression to try to capture mm -hmm. all of the different feelings um, that we have uh, in our current world you know so it's, I, one of my favorite emojis actually is the, the one that has no mouth that's just two eyes because like what how is how is that how is that a face what is that expressing what does that express you know i never know my favorite emoji is the upside down smiley face <laughs> yeah. 
because it just I don't know what it means really. Sometimes I use it when I don't know how to respond to something. Right, right. You're like, you're like <laughs> it's like a shrug. It's like the shrug right. emoji. Shrug. Yeah, maybe that's maybe that's our shrug emoji. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the shrug emoji um, or the, the the shrug emoticon, right? That you use. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was very grateful that you um, that you printed it uh, in in the book um, itself. Um, should I read a little bit? Yeah, that would be great. Um, I'm not sure what, how we're doing for time. I haven't been. We're, we're okay. okay. Um, so I'm just going to read from the introduction, and I, I will I will cue when that emoticon comes in. I know exactly which usage you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Every real face is interesting, worth looking at often precisely because of its deviation from an ideal. If we think of every face, even the strangest one, as a work of art, then beauty and truth, what we claim to seek when we look at a face, what we want to hear when we say, look at me, what do you see, suddenly seem insufficient for all that a face can hold, for all that it can do. I am a mixed race Sambian woman who has been mistaken for Chinese, Dominican, Egyptian, Eritrean, Ethiopian, Mexican, Somali, Spanish, and Thai so far. My face has been compared to ET, big eyes, to a mango, asymmetry, and to Cleopatra, shrug emoji. <laughs> <laughs> Zambians often tell me I look like my mother, who had much darker skin than I, but the same bone structure. Americans, who see skin color first, don't catch the likeness. Men on the street have called me beautiful and ugly at about the same frequency. If I say, look at me, I frankly don't know what you'll see. Maybe you'll picture a meme. The 2013 movie Captain Phillips stars Tom Hanks, the coziest face that ever sat on a screen as the titular captain. When Somali pirates board his cargo ship, their leader, Abduwali Muse, played by Barkad Abdi, points at his own eyes and says, look at me, look at me, I'm the captain now. The intensity of this interracial encounter and the deft performance by the previously unknown Abdi make it a perfect meme. Hank's Hollywood smile and squinty affability contrast with Abdi's imperfect teeth and big eyes, which widen between his two commands, look at me. I recently tweeted a riff on this meme. So the tweet has me, colon, look at me, unassuming date, what? Me, look at me, unassuming date, looks at me. I'm the captain now. <laughs> the joke has layers of race and gender built into it. Hank's face hovers over my unassuming dates. My face hovers over Opti's. This is what fascinates me about faces, not their ideality, but their mutability, the way they shift and layer, they always brim with charged relation. They remind me of how art works. Art, like everything, is entangled with money, but it isn't limited to money. While philosophers have argued against objectifying people, they've also argued that the beauty of art is not a means to an end, that it does not satisfy desires, but is rather purposive without purpose. Art isn't just a commodity, an object to be bought and sold in order to satiate some craving. It's a creation and an experience. It moves and it moves us. It is this fugitive aspect of the face as art, its fleeting, fleeing quality, the sense that it is always turning into or toward or away from that I hope to evoke in these pages. I, lo I love that opening. I mean, you also bring up um, uh, in in that section the the ways that you are perceived um, in a racialized sense, and you and you go into that in much greater detail in the Hannah Crafts chapter, and also again in the um, the emoji chapter. I'm wondering kind of. What what drew you to 
um, the focusing on the Bond woman's narrative and kind of what aspect of the face you're trying to mine there? Yeah, so um, just for some context, those of you, um, some of you may know um, Professor Gates, my, my new colleague at Harvard, um, uh, discovered a manuscript in 2002 that turned out to be the first novel written by uh, an African-American woman and a former slave. And um, there was a lot of effort toward authenticating the manuscript and getting the date right and so on and so forth. But there was also a lot of interest in whether or not this woman was actually black and whether she was actually um, a, a slave. Because the writers were known, white writers were known to fake slave narratives um, in the 19th century. And there was a lot of question as to whether uh, a, a former slave could be so um, literate and erudite as to write the kind of novel that the Bond Woman's narrative is, which I, I think it's a, a wonderful novel. And what moved me to write about it, I was in a class with uh, Professor Gates at the time, I was a graduate student, and we read it in his class and um, uh, I found this one scene um, really, really beautiful. So she's in a plantation and she's perusing the family portraits of the slave masters. Um, uh, and yeah, it's, it's quite a short paragraph. So memories of the dead give at any time a haunting air to a silent room. How much more this becomes the case when standing face to face with their pictured resemblances and looking into the stony eyes, motionless and void of expression as those of an exhumed corpse. But even as I gazed, the golden light of sunset penetrating through the open windows in an oblique direction set each rigid feature in a glow. Movements like those of life came over the line of stolid faces as the shadows of a linden tree played there. And I just was so moved by it. what a beautiful passage and what a beautiful scene and what a complicated set of images, right? She's walking past these men who, the, these ancestors who have raped and killed people in her family. And they, they seem dead to her because they're in these portraits, but then the light coming through the window and the shadows cast by Linden Tree, from which a slave hangs later in the novel, are playing over their faces and bringing those faces to life. And what is so fascinating about this layering of faces of the count, like something passing over the face, making it come to life as expression, is that that is a pattern throughout the novel. Whenever she talks about people's faces, there's their face and then there's their countenance and what their countenance is doing. What's even more interesting to me is that she herself is a product of both slave and master. She's clearly um, been, you know, is the, is the product of, of, uh, of, of the rape of the enslaved in um, the 19th century because she's so light skinned that she can pass as white. And that's eventually how she comes to freedom. So you can imagine how um, complicated it is for uh, professor, scholar, historians to be arguing this woman was really black when she says herself repeatedly, I was light enough to pass. I, I looked white, right? So the question of how race is actually manifesting on her face and through her, you know, um, through the words that she, she uh, uses becomes really fascinating. And I, there's this amazing scene um, also where she punishes her mistress, a very cruel um, white mistress of hers by um, making her apply a face powder and smelling salts at the same time that react and make the, her mistress's face turn black which is one of the earliest, I think it is actually the earliest example of uh, a kind of science fictional trope mm. of, um, of someone changing their race um, or changing someone else's race, which I'm actually writing an article right now about the okay. history of those moments of racial transformation, which I don't know if some of you might be watching Lovecraft Country or 
I think it's called Lovecraft Country, yeah. uh, um, where there's uh, a, a science fictional, again, kind of uh, alembic or you know alchemical means by which um, a black woman becomes white. So this this history of racial transformation is also um, uh, really fascinating to me. And so this this book struck me um, very much. Um, as I was as I was reading it as a student, as being really interesting when it came to this question of racial ambiguity, as someone who is you know has been described as racially ambiguous, but for whom uh, growing up in Zambia I had a very specific racial category where I was colored, mm -hmm. which is mixed race, but also um, someone for whom um, being a black woman and looking like my black mother has also been a foundational part of my identity. So I, I, I just found, you know, Hannah, when I think about Hannah, I think of her as like a sister in this, <laughs> in this yeah. enterprise of trying to understand what it means to, to be racialized. No, it's, it's totally fascinating the way that it appears. And I think also because it, it, um, it takes such a close look also at the critical reception of the book, or at least the critical reception of the different critical receptions to it. Um, <laughs> people are kind of, re-litigating its authorship and uh, for the most part it's white dudes doing the relitigating of it and kind of uh, perpetuating these same kinds of arguments that would have uh, emerged around the time of its initial publication but it's it's a really fascinating look at that. Yeah. I mean and I think and it's it's uh, it's still something that we think about all the time now. So, you know, I mentioned Cleopatra and there's this, you know, the news that Gal Gadot has been uh, cast as the new Cleopatra. And so there's been a lot of criticism of this, but then a lot of people being like, but actually Cleopatra was Greek and so it's fine. <laughs> um, but this question of, of um, you know, even Cleopatra's beauty, which comes up in my chapter on the Elephant Man, um, where I'm, I think of, I try to, to posit that his face is as famous to us as Cleopatra's face is, but on opposite ends of the spectrum of what we consider to be beauty. And yet, you know, the, the evidence that we have is that Cleopatra actually wasn't beautiful according to today's standards. Um, in fact, what she was known for from historians was having a, an incredible charisma that had very little to do with her physical features. Um, in the same way that Joseph Merrick was very famously um, had a kind of gentleness that you know people really um, uh, saw at, in kind of contrast with his face. So I think it's it's very interesting that we're still kind of litigating questions of race when it comes to a figure like Cleopatra, but also that we're constantly reforming and playing with again the question of beauty and how that works um, in relation to to faces. I, I really like that. I'm looking at the time now I'm wondering if we should open it up to questions from the audience. Yeah that would be great. Definitely um, and I think uh, I want to give people a little bit of time to just I guess um, sit with and digest all of that, that brilliant conversation. Um, and, and to formulate questions as well. Namali, would you like to read uh, something else uh, oh, for sure. five minutes or so, and then we can see if anyone has any questions then? Sure. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, and thank you, Adam, for, for jumping in. Okay, I'm going to read from um, the conclusion which is uh, about the GIF or the GIF. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I joke in here that our oscillation between the two pronunciations is very apt for something that is about visual oscillation. <laughs> um, so I'm here talking about what's uh, Lauren Michelle Jackson, um, the professor and um, now staff writer at The New Yorker calls digital blackface. Um, which is the tendency for black femmes, black women, black queer men, um, black trans women to carry the weight of emotional labor online 
um, that they their faces tend to be the faces that we see in um, in, in expressing uh, things in, in GIFs. And we, we saw this happen live uh, with um, Kamala Harris just last week, <laughs> right? um, where her expressions during the, the vice presidential debate were immediately memed. But despite this troubling fact, let us not dismiss the cultural dominance of the black femme face. A vast flock of black femme faces flutters across the field of the internet. GIFs of the Real Housewives of Atlanta, Whitney Houston, Mariah Carey, RuPaul, Angela Bassett, Naomi Campbell, Viola Davis, Rihanna, Beyonce, Kiki Palmer, and of course, the black woman with the greatest affective range, plasticity, nuance, and exposure to her face, and the longest history of taking on American emotional burdens is Oprah Winfrey. Oprah turns and opens her hands. What did I tell you? Oprah leans back into someone, the barest flinch reflecting her pleasure in what she's watching. Oprah spreads her arms, her yelling mouth wide with joy. Oprah dabs her eyes with a white tissue. Oprah looks skeptical, a narrowed eye, a blink, a frown. Oprah is our reigning queen of the gif. One of my favorite gifs, I had to do an internet search to replicate it, but I chose not to hunt for its biographical origin, which seems besides the point to me, is of an anonymous black woman with her eyes rolling back in ecstasy. I don't know if you guys can see it. Can you see it okay? You know this one? <laughs> At some point, someone, again, I don't know who, elected to add a kind of trippy filter to intensify the intended effect, which is per the meme's name, OMG, wow, yes. This is a 21st century impressionist portrait, continuously looping from two to three dimensions. This woman's beauty, her race, gender, class, ability, her availability for a face-to-face -face interaction, her relationship to me and to the world, the time between now and whenever this clip was recorded, made into a GIF and distorted for emphasis. None of this really matters to the effect of my encounter with it. I've never actively used it as a reaction online, but I see her face all the time, a one-way gaze as I doubt she's ever seen mine. This face isn't a mirror of my soul or a window into hers. It's a face set in motion by the force of a specific feeling, a specific moment. It will never perfectly map onto whatever I'm feeling, nor does it pretend to. Rather, it resonates with me, reverberates with an emotional intensity set free from its bodily source. This strange stranger's face can't be profiled or co-opted, not even by its original bearer, whom it just happened to flutter over, ripple through, with a deep and unaccountable pleasure. Thank you so much for reading that, <clears throat> or for, excuse me, for reading that passage. Um, so it doesn't look like we have any questions from the audience yet. Um, and I should say, I if you, minutes, I think I'm seeing in the, um, in the chat that some people are mentioning uh, the old drift. So if you have questions about the old drift, I'd be happy to answer those as well. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious. Um, this book and um, your academic work are, I think people often say that they're quite different from your novel writing, but in a lot of ways it feels like they share a lot of affinities. I'm curious what the relationship is between them. I mean, um, The Old Drift is a work of science fiction in some ways, and you highlight the science fictional qualities of the faces that you're focusing on here. I mean, and also there's um, there's that really lovely um, analysis of the the reconstructed face in Jennifer Egan's novel. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of curious what the relationship is between. Uh, maybe this is getting too broad, but just between the science fictional aspects of your fiction and the science fictional aspects of your nonfiction? I think that 
there, I mean, I, I think my, my interest in science fiction as such is, um, is one of the reasons that I'm, you know, to, to classify the Bonhomme's narrative as being part of a, a history of science fiction is unusual, but it's because I'm attuned to certain aspects of genre that, um, because I like them, because I enjoy them. I think my interest in science fiction in some ways is just because of my interest in science. I, I've just always been really um, drawn to the sciences. I was almost a microbiology major in college um, and I went to a science and math high school. Um, I think when it comes to the question of faces in particular, one of the aspects of genre in my novel that I see emerging in Stranger Faces as well is a, is a specific interest in the borders between things. Um, mm. So the, the kind of surfaces of things, but as live, as kind of um, thresholds, uh, rather than as simply um, something that covers or conceals some, some kind of depth. So this idea that there's like shifting countenances in a face um, you know, in Hannah Crafts, the shadow, you know, coming across those portraits has some imagistic relationship to Sibylla's face in my novel, who has, you know, it's a woman whose hair is, is growing all the time and the hair shifting back and forth over her face is a kind of veil. Um, I have another character whose skin, who is blind and whose skin occasionally looks to the people who, um, who love her um, as though her skin is covered in eyes like the, the Greek god Argos. Um, so that the idea that, uh, that the surface of the face um, can shift uh, in and out of um, uh, reality or it can even, you know, can, can shift in and out of visibility is something that, that I'm clearly playing on in the novel as well. I think I just, I'm very interested in, in where the body ends and the world begins. And, I'm, and that applies not just to the face, but also to certain kinds of technology. I'm very interested in prosthetics, right? The, the parts mm -hmm. of, I think if I had, if I had, if I had, had my druthers, I would have written uh, something about robotic faces <laughs> um, in, in, this, in this book as well, because I'm very interested in um, how we, how technology kind of becomes part of what we do. I talk a little bit in the emoji um, chapter about like the, our relationship to our phones, for example, and, and our fingers in contact with technology um, and what that means as well. So I think there's also some relation there. Yeah, I love that idea about um, the boundary between where things begin and end. And it feels in, in the case of Stranger Faces um, and in your fiction, like the boundary is very mutable. It's, it's always shifting and the ways that it shifts um, feels like it reveals interesting things about the way that we think about the world and think about ourselves. I hope um, and that, there, there's a question here that I think might speak to this conversation um, pretty well. Uh, it's from James, and I apologize if I pronounce uh, their last name, but James Marua um, asks, uh, you wrote a whole book from your internet experiences, Teach Me Your Ways. Um, and I think that I, have, I have sort of a similar question that I was struggling to articulate um, in regards to like bringing the, the sort of like, you know, self that exists on the internet and and that that separate self to the extent that we can call it separate um into the experience uh, into uh, one's personal experience and then into onto the page um and negotiating these sort of different different zones of one's life on the page um i don't know it i feel like that is for me sort of related to this notion of the science fictional and, and technology and um how those things intersect i was wondering if you could speak to that yeah, the avatar, um, for sure. And um, uh, a question from Jonah, what do you think of the relationship between authors, their text, and author photo kind of speaks to that as well. Um, so, you know, the beginning of this, of this book, uh, I say, look at me, I know you can't. But of course, I couldn't read that out to you now because presumably those of you who, who uh, are seeing um, would be able to see my face. But I do think that the relationship between um, what someone's voice is um, uh, as conveyed through 
one your reading of their voice in the text and their face is again it's a kind of uh unscratchable itch for human beings we always want to put a face to the book right you want to google you know to see what someone looks like when you read something that they say but of course you know we have this um incredible uh, <laughs> elaboration of that impulse um, on the internet in the form of Facebook, right? Um, and I, I think maybe James is referring to my short story, The Book of Faces, which is a short story in the form of a Facebook newsfeed, but which has, of course, no descriptions of any faces, <laughs> um, because there's a kind of um, uh, way that we've used this medium not to fix the face as much as you have to put a real photograph of your face for Facebook and all of this stuff, but we've used it instead to elaborate all these masks, just more signification, <laughs> more signs, right? And so again, I, for me, it's what seems to be always the case is that when we try to fix the face, it ends up proliferating into just a kind of multiplicity of faces. And I would be more interested in that proliferation than ever in trying to identify myself with one particular face. Um, I think it's, um, it's, a, it's a missed opportunity to a certain extent. Uh, one of the, the, the things that Chris talks about in his book, The Face, um, which I really enjoyed, um, is he talks about the scars that accrue over time on a face. And the way that a face holds time to me is so fascinating. Um, and this is why I like the, the GIF, you know, is like you don't just have a single photograph, um, but you have some kind of expressive way um, of, of opening your face um, uh, into, into time. Um, but um, I'm not sure if I exactly, I'm not sure if I exactly answered your question, but um, there's a question here um, about whether mask wearing will affect children's ability to interpret emotion. Um, and I, I mean, and, and will it change the way they express emotion? I think inevitably any kind of apparatus or prosthetic is going to change how we interact. But I don't think um, um, to Kristen um, that this is necessarily a bad thing. I think as I was, so what I, I said earlier about masks is that I think it's actually showing us how many other things apart from the human face we use as ways to understand um, uh, what another person is and who another person is. And, um, and you know, our, our, our reliance on the face-to-face -face encounter, on the live encounter even, is obviously compromised right now. But there's so many other ways that human beings have compensated for that distance between people I mean, this is why we have language, right? This is why we invented letters and literature, is that so that things can traverse um, these things. I, I mean, sign language, when you think about how important the hands are to how we express emotion, right? The, there's just so many different ways that I think children will compensate um, for uh, not having uh, access to, to, to faces all the time. I mean, faces will, be, will obviously change and how we relate to them will change, but I'm always hesitant to think of technologies or prostheses as leading to a decline in anything. I think human beings are just way too resilient and creative for that. Um, every technology just has a different set of uses, a different set of possibilities for us. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll answer Jeffrey's question. Um, I do think the face can prevent, oh, so I should read it, sorry. <laughs> In the brothers Karamazov, Ivan says to his brother Alyosha, if I must love my fellow man, he had better hide himself for no sooner, than, no sooner do I see his face than there's an end to my love for him. Elder Zosima has often discussed that, Alyosha remarked. He also said that a man's face often prevents those inexperienced in love from loving him. What do you think about this counterintuitive version that the face can prevent one from loving one's neighbor or loving others? I do believe that. I do believe that as is the case for most things, power looks for ways to differentiate people. And there are many, many different ways that it does that, right? Race, for example, was invented as a way to differentiate people, some of whom deserved rights and some of whom didn't. And 
the notion of the face, um, a, a particular kind of face, a face that's legible, a face that's beautiful, that's symmetrical, that is of that looks like you, that reminds you of your family. All of those have been deployed as ways of separating people out into people you love and people you don't love. And um, something I find really fascinating about um, your use here of loving one's neighbor is that the neighbor is uh, figuratively someone who is next to you. And so I mentioned this earlier, you're, when you're next to someone, you don't see their face. <laughs> you might see their profile, however. And so you find like someone like Toni Morrison, I write about this in my first academic book, Toni Morrison is obsessed with profiles. She's constantly writing about the view from someone to the side. And she always is writing about people standing next to each other, holding hands. It's a different kind of uh, picture of a human relationship. And what the face-to-face -face encounter she describes is, uh, is a horrific one where two faces um, can, that lead, that can lead to a kind of parasitic uh, obsessive relationship and uh, beloved even says I'm chewing her face with my own face you know so face to face is actually dangerous in in some of Morrison's work precisely because it can keep you from the kind of solidarity of the next two of the of the neighbor of being next to one another so I totally think um, that that um, the brothers K is right I haven't I haven't um, uh, read that book in over a decade, but it's, it is my favorite, uh, Dostoevsky, and I, I am very inclined to make Adam put that quote as the epigraph to the second edition if we ever have a reprinting <laughs> of this book, because it's exactly, um, it's exactly the argument that I make. Wonderful. Um, I think, unfortunately, I see there's one more, con one more question down here, but I think, unfortunately, we are running out of time. Um, but well, I don't know. Maybe this is a maybe it's a, a, a question that we can answer in in the the few minutes. Yeah, I can try to to do it quickly. Okay. Um. So this is from Connor. The mutability of the face you're describing is very much in contrast to facial recognition technology, which att which attempts to isolate the face in a specific time and read information from and classify it or as we know in a racial sense, fail to recognize or misrecognize, how is this attempt to fix a face similar to or different from what you're describing as proliferation from a face being fixed? So I think this is a, a great example. And I, I talk about it a little bit in my conclusion that the, the, the notion of profiling or surveilling um, the face and facial recognition technology is a, a 21st century kind of version of this tension between, as you say, trying to fix the face and um, the, the refusal of the face to be fixed. So one of the things that we've noted um, in the protests that have been largely masked is that it's made it harder for people to recognize um, uh, people's faces, it's been harder for the police to survey faces. We also have um, a, a kind of uh, I mean, it's, I, I'm smiling, it's a horrible fact, but it is also a slightly delicious irony that the racial bias in algorithmic technology means that facial recognition technology can't be applied as it wants to be to black faces. Um, because uh, algorithms don't recognize black faces as faces. It's more likely to recognize us as monkeys, for example. Um, there's studies that show that, you know, these algorithms are based on people's perceptions of faces. But we just saw, I think, um, just the other day, someone released a, a study, a, published a, a scientific publication that was trying to map, uh, use facial recognition um, technology through an algorithm to map the faces and portraits and photographs to people's kind of trustworthiness, which is essentially just eugenics all over again, <laughs> which is to say these attempts to fix the face, profile it, classify it, we just are using new technologies to try to do it. But I think that per that paradox that racism means that the algorithm won't work. I think that 
human beings, you know, will find, and we've seen the protesters in Hong Kong um, using various ways of putting makeup on, various ways of putting masks on, various ways of, of making light uh, interfere with the technology that would profile them, that human beings will always resist that kind of fixity, that kind of attempt to isolate because they recognize it's a tool of power. So I think the more we can embrace the pleasure we find in the proliferation of faces, um, the more we can actually resist that as well. I think that's a really lovely place to end. Um, thank you so much, Adam and Namali, for, for spending time with us tonight. Um, thank and thank you. you everyone who was able to tune in and ask these really amazing questions. Um, I'm glad we were able to get a bunch of them in at the end. Um, I just want to plug our next event um, on October 21st with Jello Guo in a conversation with John Freeman. Uh, the event will be co-sponsored by uh, the Seminary Co-op Bookstore in Chicago, big fan of them. Um, so it's going to be absolutely incredible. Um, if you are interested in that, you can just uh, register for that on our on our website, brooklinebooksmith.com. Uh, again, big thank you to everyone who showed up tonight, or if it's uh, morning where you are this morning, this afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, yeah, and I hope everyone has a, has a really good rest of their days. Take care. Thank, thank you all so much. And Bye. thanks so much, Adam. <laughs> yeah.